I'll just tell you the shape of the evening in theory. So um, I'm going to uh, give a talk to introduce the theme, the, new, the theme of this new Sangha program, which is called Living a Dharma Life. I think I will talk for about half an hour. And uh, depending on timing, I might just then lead us briefly in some reflections on some of the themes that I've covered. And then uh, for those who want to, we're going to break out uh, groups. Feel free not to, just to, just to sit quietly if you'd rather, and then rejoin afterwards. Um, we'll have a few announcements. Uh, a few lovely announcements. And then I'll lead a meditation before we chant the last Vantana to end the evening. So that's the shape of things. So this theme, living a Dharma life, it might seem a funny place to start, but I wanted to start by giving a bit of a health warning about the risks of idealism. The idealized view that we might have of what it means, what it looks like to live a Dharma life. And um, I'm starting here because in a way this, uh, this is what bubbled up for me uh, last week. So I've been thinking about this talk, this theme, for quite a while now. But last week was quite a challenging week, had its moments. I was looking after my parents down in London and uh, I wasn't always at my best. And at various moments, pondering the idea of living a Dharma life. I had moments of feeling a bit inadequate, of thinking I'm not living up to the ideal of living a Dharma life. And one experience in particular stands out. I think of it as my channeling my inner John McEnroe experience. So I'll just share a little bit about that with you. So it starts with my dad's mobile phone, which he lost possibly two years ago, possibly longer, uh, and for which he has been paying monthly, despite it being who knows where. And at a certain point quite recently, he stopped paying these monthly payments. And I have been trying to cancel the contract and pay the outstanding debt of £18.99. But my dad cannot remember the password for his mobile phone contract. So despite hours on the phone, possibly all of you have had something similar to this experience, hours on hold, hours talking to various people. They will not let me close the contract and they will not let me make the payment, which they have referred to the debt collectors, despite me being there with my card ready to pay. I had posted a copy of the power of attorney with the post office. I have a proof of posting. It has been signed for, but they have not received it. So one of the people that I spoke to suggested that I go to Walmart or another grocery store to buy a voucher. This would be a way to pay the debt. However, I have not been able to find anywhere where I can buy this voucher. So eventually one person I spoke to said, I don't really know what else we can do for you. Would you like to make a complaint? And I said, sure, because there didn't seem to be many other options opening up. And they said that a manager would call me back. So later that day, I was playing tennis with my dad. It is the highlight of his week to play tennis. He really, really loves it. He's done it all his, well, much of his life. So uh, I try and give him a decent game as best I can. So there we were playing tennis, but I'd left my mobile phone on the bench and was trying to keep an ear out for it. 
So the phone rang and I belted over saying, sorry, dad, I've got to take this call. And it was the manager of the mobile phone company, which I really mustn't say their name, must I? In case this is going up on the internet. Um, however, I am still not allowed to pay the £18.99. They have not received the power of attorney. I need to photocopy it and send it again. They cannot do anything to reissue the password because a third party, that's me, is now involved. Otherwise, they would refer it to the bereavement team, apparently, even though my father is not dead. But if he was in trouble, they would do that with him. But as I am now involved, we cannot go to the bereavement team, despite them sounding actually rather helpful. He wants me to write down another address, but I have no pen because I'm on the tennis court. He says he will ring me back. So I put down the phone and I kind of had been, I think, a bit energized, a bit indignant. But just then I feel kind of ground down and so weary and with a sense of wanting to give up. So I find myself flipping between these two modes, a kind of um, adrenalized, sympathetic arousal and a kind of dorsal, I give up, shut down. I flip between the two. At times I feel beside myself. I feel like I have lost it. I have images of hurling the tennis racket against the fence, I have, I have fantasies of jumping up and down on the tennis racket and thrashing it until it is in pieces. I know this is a bad idea, but I cannot help the images of destroying my tennis racket and hitting balls very hard from my mind. But I know it is a bad idea. So I simply swipe my racket around in the air and make slightly frustrated growling noises. If you had seen me, you might have thought that does not look like someone living a Dharma life. Finding myself fuming with frustration, I thought, this does not look like someone living a Dharma life. I felt their sense of contrast between how I am feeling just then and my ideals. Luckily, I also remembered that I need to use my ideals as a compass to guide me and not as a stick to beat myself up with. So that helped. Apparently uh, the T. Ratnaloka Retreat Center now talks about the Bodhisattva path rather than the Bodhisattva ideal because that's less likely to set us up with a sense of um, ideals that we can uh, uh, fail at as it were. So a Dharma life is messy. It doesn't go to plan. It has difficulties. It has frustrating encounters with bureaucracy. And it has dukkha. Dukkha meaning anything from outright suffering to just a nagging sense of unease or dissatisfaction. It has dukkha like any other life. But at least some of the time, living a Dharma life means having a different relationship to dukkha, to difficulty. Different to the normal range of human responses to dukkha, which includes the racket rage response. I think that's more in the fight rather than the flight uh, territory. So central to a Dharma life is how we relate to dukkha at whatever moment we spot it, whether we're far down the road, have been creating some kind of inner hell of dukkha for some time, or whether we spot it quite early. At some point, we spot it and we have a chance to relate to it differently, to stop creating it, stop making it worse. So it's the heart of the Buddha's teaching, suffering and the ending of suffering. So this reminded me of um, a sutta about what are called the worldly winds, about how we get blown around by the worldly winds of pleasure and pain, praise 
and blame, getting what we want and losing things that we love. So our normal response to pain or loss or blame is to be blown around as if we were in a storm. We get upset, we ruminate, we get consumed in thinking about these things. We often make ourselves feel worse. We don't see their impermanent nature. We don't see how we're adding to them. And this sutta contrasts our normal response to that of a well-trained disciple of the Buddha who knows and discerns the painful experience. His or her mind is not consumed by it, does not rebel against it. So back to me for a minute, channeling my inner John McEnroe. So I managed to bring some awareness to the moment, to know and name the experience. I, find my, I found myself saying, out of a, a good habit, this is dukkha. This is dukkha, plain and simple. This is unpleasant. So initially that didn't seem to help very much, but gradually I could feel it have a kind of steadying effect, a sort of grounding of just touching into, this is what my experience is just now. I could feel the unpleasantness of it, a sense of wild energy in my body and my hands sense of frustration in my head. And the thought ar arose, this is mind made. This is mind made. This swirl of sensations and emotions created in the mind, reactive thoughts, wanting things differently. And possibly in there as well, some grief in relation to my parents, coming out as irritability. And in the midst of this, my dad, who had been waiting patiently on the bench with his tennis racket, looked very kindly at me as I growled and swished my racket around. He looked at me and he said, you are very like me, aren't you? So he's generally a peaceful man, but occasionally he erupts with rage at the hoover or other inanimate objects that are resisting whatever he wants from them. So I thought, ah, oh, yeah, there is something else in here, isn't there, in the mix. There is some genes, some biology, perhaps some childhood conditioning. This is a conditioned experience, I thought. So there was some understanding that this dukkha has arisen in dependence on conditions. Various stressors, thoughts, habits, biology, childhood, a whole mix. And then some meta arose. I think his empathy and my own sense of the conditioned nature of the experience helped me bring some self meta, some compassion rather than self judgment. And then finally, I had a sense of needing restraint, a kind of resolve not to act it out, that it needed some containing. I thought particularly of my mum, whose moods can be uh, quite vulnerable. And I thought I need to process this to some degree and kind of contain this before I get home. I need not to upset my mother with this. It reminds me of a quote I love from the Burmese teacher, uh, Utejaniya. The mind is not yours, but you are responsible for it. The mind is not yours, but you are responsible for it. So in that moment, I just had a sense of needing to take responsibility and not add any more aversion and swirling, not make it worse. So gradually, I went from being in the dukkha, consumed by it, rebelling against the situation, rebelling against the mobile phone company heartily, to a more conscious relationship with the dukkha. Acknowledging, knowing, naming it. Feeling it in the body. Seeing its conditioned nature, its impersonal nature. 
feeling compassion for the being afflicted by it, otherwise known as me, and connecting with an ethical intent. The great writer and activist James Baldwin says this, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So I think that's the starting point, the facing, the acknowledging what's happening. So I'll say a little bit now about um, some key ingredients of a Dharma life. So there are a few themes from this story of mine that I imagine you will hear emerging again and again over the coming months of this program. Mindfulness, I'm sure, will be a theme. Awareness, presence, being present with ourselves, with others. Mindful of what our mind is up to. And then metta. Metta, loving kindness for ourselves and for others. Compassion what metta becomes when it meets suffering. And wisdom, seen through the delusion of a self, the contracting around a sense of self that causes craving and aversion and gives rise to much of our suffering. And the possibility of a different relationship to dukkha, especially seeing how we create suffering for ourselves and doing that less. And one other key ingredient I wanted to talk about, key ingredient of a Dharma life, is a positive kind of dukkha. A positive kind of uh, unpleasantness. So that might sound surprising, but dukkha can be a pleasant, a positive, sorry, it can be a positive state of mind, even when it's unpleasant. It can be a positive and ethically positive state of mind. So I'm thinking particularly of the quality of regret or remorse when our conscience pricks us. And it's called in Pali, I think, hri. Hri, it's this quality um, of, of remorse, of regret. So it may not be pleasant, but it's a vital ingredient in a Dharma life. And experiencing it, when it arises, it means we are connected with our values and it spurs us on to do better. So I wanted to share a story that a friend told me recently. It's a story of becoming aware of unconscious bias, of unconscious racial bias. So my friend is white and in their fifties. And on this occasion, they were sitting outside a pub in a rural area. And they saw a black man walking towards them. And they felt, they noticed a bodily response, mild, but not nothing. And they noticed the thought arising, maybe he's going to ask me for money. The man just kept walking, walked past him and sat down at another table outside the pub. And suddenly my friend noticed a sense that the man had stopped being other and had become one of us, one of us in the pub, outside the pub. And my friend said they felt a sense of free in that moment, a sense of remorse for the othering of that man that had been happening in their mind, the unconscious negative assumptions. And then they thought, that has probably happened in my mind many times in my life. I've just never seen it before. And they welcomed the free, the sense of remorse. The remorse that came with the dawning of awareness of the bias that had been operating. And that awareness, that remorse can spur us on to change for the better. And my friend said to me, 
That's 50 years of wasted opportunity for free. That's 50 years of wasted opportunity for free. All those years when they could have seen bias in their minds and didn't. So free is essential for the spiritual life, for transformation. And I was just, I was moved by my friend, kind of embracing, welcoming the free and uh, regretting the missed opportunities for the wonder of free all those years. What a moving way to relate to the pricking of our conscience as an opportunity, a gift that helps us grow, a thing to be welcomed. So I've got a couple more themes to touch on. So the next one is how many different ways there are of living a Dharma life. And that's partly, I think, why I was inspired by this theme. I thought it doesn't have to look a certain way. And I want people to know that. So we can be curious about how we do imagine it. So just now, what images or ideas or thoughts come to mind for you when I say living a Dharma life? Do you imagine a monk or a nun? Someone quietly meditating on their own? Solitary retreat in a little cabin in Wales? Or a cave up in the Himalayas? Or do you imagine a group of people, a sangha, a sense of community, spiritual friendship? Or do you imagine someone engaged with the suffering of the world, perhaps as a Dharma teacher, or in a role like a counselor or social worker, or campaigning for social justice. Some activity that expresses what we sometimes call the altruistic dimension of going for refuge to the three jewels. Or maybe something totally different came to your mind. A few years ago, I heard a talk that I really enjoyed by an old member called Vadra Gupta. And he talked about three ways of living a Dharma life, three kind of archetypes. One was the forest renunciant. So that's the meditative recluse in the forest. The second was a Sangha builder, someone engaged in trying to create Sangha, trying to create in a way, um, a little bit more of an oasis a different kind of a, a different kind of way of being in relationship with each other that can be inspiring encouraging for the rest of the world and the third one was the archetype of the social engager so i wonder if you are drawn to any one of these and there's more of course the tree ratna order is not monastic so for many of us, our working life and our family life will be the main context for our practice. As Sangharakshita said, who founded Tri Ratna, commitment is primary, lifestyle is secondary. Commitment is primary, lifestyle is secondary. So that doesn't mean that your lifestyle doesn't matter, that the conditions don't matter, but a whole range of lifestyles are possible. And the commitment to practice is what is of central importance. So in the Sangha nights coming up over the next few months, you'll hear from all sorts of people. Some who live in Buddhist communities in retreat centers, and also people bringing up a family, practicing as parents in the midst of family life. You will hear from the social workers, poets and authors, and people involved with the COVID emergency response in India. So it's easy to think that a Dharma life should look a certain way. Maybe it's just easy in general to slip into a should. To think that it looks like someone else's life, 
or some idealized life. But it can look however your life looks. If there's a thread of metta, mindfulness, of clear seeing, engaging with the Buddha's teachings, if they're on your radar, if those things are important in your life, then it's a Dharma life, if you want it to be. And those times when we lose it, when our inner Mackinro gets in the driving seat, though actually now I think he's a pretty reformed character, but he's a kind of archetype in our culture, isn't he? Those moments when he hurled his racket about. When those things happen, when they erupt in our being, it doesn't mean it's not a Dharma life. So this is the last bit of my talk. And this is another reason why I was drawn to this theme of living a Dharma life. It's because it gives us an opportunity to explore what it means to engage with the world in a Dharmic way. How Dharmic engagement with suffering in the world might look different to social activism more generally to ecological activism more generally. What difference does it make if we bring a dharmic perspective, a dharmic way of engaging? I imagine as people explore this theme on our Sangha nights, the themes of metta and mindfulness will come through. The theme of seeing through self will come through. Cornell West puts it very well, I think, when he says, Justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. So the implications of taking metta, loving kindness and wisdom into public will be things like not demonizing others who we disagree with, still treating them with respect, being motivated by compassion, not by fear and hatred and other afflictive emotions. Practicing self metta and not burning out or getting overwhelmed. Acting out of stillness. Acting from a place of calm abiding. From a place of wholesome mental states. And looking at things through the lens of karma and conditionality. Knowing that the ends don't justify the means. That how we go about acting will shape the outcomes that we achieve. Our outcomes will mirror the ways that we went about achieving them. So next week, we have an order member from uh, Glastonbury, whose name is Loka Bandu. And his title for the talk he'll give next week is Buddhists like retreating, should they be advancing? Buddhists like retreating, should they be advancing? So he'll give some personal reflections um, on Buddhism and social change. So a Dharma life has an inner and an outer aspect. They're both essential like two wings of a bird. The inner dimension is a rich and vital one, getting to know our minds on the cushion and off the cushion, working on our minds very directly in meditation, seeing the nature of experience more clearly by looking when conditions are quiet and still and seeing through, catching glimpses through the delusion of self that causes so much suffering. So in many ways, Buddhism is an introspective path, but not simply for the purposes of our own healing and personal transformation. The introspection helps us respond more ethically and effectively to the world around us. So the outer dimension of a Dharma life is also vital. Engaging with the world, 
delighting in others, sharing their joys, and also responding to their suffering. So, so there's the avoidable suffering that we all cause ourselves sometimes. There's the suffering that we cause to other beings, other beings, not just human beings, other beings, including the ones that sometimes we eat. And there's the social causes of suffering that humans inflict on each other. The cruelty, the discrimination, the injustice that manifests in human societies and between them. And all these forms of suffering are interlinked. We are part of the whole. And our liberation is bound up with the liberation of others. This is one of my very favorite quotes at the moment. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So that invitation comes from an Aboriginal rights group in Australia from the 70s. So one manifestation of suffering that we've heard about in recent weeks is the catastrophe unfolding in India as the COVID pandemic deepens. In the newsletter yesterday, I shared an excellent article that Amish Kapoor wrote in the Times this week, highlighting the way that caste-based discrimination is resulting in the burden of COVID falling disproportionately on people from low caste or untouchable Dalit communities. And the Karuna Trust is one of many organizations that have been working to help. The Karuna Trust works with partners in India and is distributing emergency supplies of food and soap, has projects to protect women and girls who are vulnerable to violence during the lockdown, and is supporting teams of medical doctors in the slums. So if you'd like to support Karuna's emergency COVID appeal, have a look at their website. Or you could use the, the link, which I think Rajapriya may have and could put in the chat. Thank you. So I'll just recap quickly. I started by talking about the risks of, ideal, uh, of idealism, of idealizing a Dharma life. And I shared my McEnroe moment in the hope of encouraging and inspiring you when you have similar moments of losing it one way or another. I talked about having a different relationship to suffering, to dukkha, not just being consumed by it and making it worse, but facing it with awareness, compassion, a sense of its conditioned and impermanent nature. I talked next about the key ingredients of a Dharma life, metta, mindfulness, seeing through self, having that different relationship to Dukkha whenever we can manage it. And welcoming in remorse, free, when our conscience pricks. I talked about diversity, the wide range of lifestyles and ways of living out a Dharma life. And then lastly, I talked about Dharmic engagement with the world, with social suffering, with ecological issues. And I think you will get more on that theme from Loka Bandhu next week. <laughs>